graphics cards seem to get more expensive every generation. So this is why I have chosen to take a look at, I think, one of the, if not the best graphics card under 300 bucks. First of all, to start with, as you can see, I have chosen for this category the Radeon RX 6650 XT. The reason for that is this card is basically the same as a 6600 XT, just overclocked a bit, but it costs almost the same. Most times it can be found even a few bucks cheaper, um, which is kind of weird, but well, I won't complain since it is a bit faster, not by much, but it's still a few percent. So, hey, something that you gotta keep in mind. In this video, I'm going to show you everything about the Sapphire RX 6650 XT Pulse because this one is the one I got for around 250 bucks. First of all, about the card itself. This is one of the um, least expensive um, Sapphire cards in existence or rather that you can buy. It has a very basic cooler, but it still works pretty good. As we know from Sapphire, everything is pretty solid and everything is reliable as it should be and the cooler is at least decent. Looking at the physical appearance, we have two fans as is usual with most of these cards with a relatively large diameter of 100 millimeters. And um, yeah, that's basically it from the front. We don't have any lighting or something. So this card is really, really basic. We only have a backplate as a kind of addition that is for well, optical reasons. Um, that does not do anything in terms of cooling. There are no thermal pads on the backside, but this is needed as well because there is no memory on the back as well. So it's just so that the card looks a bit better, which is nice. Though it is even a metal backplate, at least it feels that way. Coming to the cooler, which you can't really see through the fans, but I'm just gonna tell you and show you some pictures of it because Tech Power Up did a pretty good teardown of the card. I don't wanna tear it down right now because I don't have any benefit on that. So I'm just gonna look at some pictures. Uh, the cooler has only two heat pipes, which should be plenty for the card because that uh, the TDP of the card is 180 watts, um, which turns out to be around 145 watts for the GPU and the rest of the power goes to the VRM and uh, VRM losses and basically memory and such. So it's not so powerful that you would need anything really big to keep the card cool and uh, that reflects the temperatures and cooling performance as well, but we're gonna go get to that later. Also, the cooler is designed pretty good because it does not have a base plate that touches the VRMs and is only cooled by airflow, but the cooler itself touches the VRAM and the VRMs so that they mostly don't get that hot at all and are pretty much at almost the same temperature as the core is as well. And because the card has a relatively overbuilt VRM for what it is, um, the VRM should be kept of around 300 amps, but even when you max out the power limit, um, the GPU only pulls about 150 at maximum. So the limits are way beyond what you would ever reach in that case. This is why the card also only has an 8-pin power connector, so you can in theory pull 150 watts from the 8-pin and 75 watts from the PCIe slot, so that would be a total of 225 watts. As display outputs go, we only have one HDMI 2.1, which is standard nowadays, and we have three display ports, which should be plenty for most of you. Uh, you can obviously use four displays at the same time as you can with uh, almost every new card, so shouldn't be a problem here. Obviously, we also don't have any BIOS switches or LEDs or whatever on this card, as I said before, because this is a very basic card. It isn't even overclocked, so you also are not getting any more power than you would with a reference card. First, we are going to look at the cooling performance, though. And for this, I'm going to show you a clip now that shows the RX 6650 XT under full load. 
and if you have set my voice or the video for to a normal volume you will also be able to judge the noise of the card in real life one clip is on in stock form and one clip is with the power limit set to plus 10 percent So as you can see, cooling is not that big of an issue. The card is relatively quiet, although you might be able to hear it. It's not really that annoying as some other um, really loud cards are. If you raise the power limit, these 10%, it gets a bit louder, but still is within reason. Next, we're gonna have a look at the gaming benchmarks. And there we are testing mostly very intensive games because that is probably the most interesting part. What can this card do? Obviously, esports titles such as Counter-Strike, um, Fortnite or whatever, are pretty much not an issue for this card, especially on like 1080p resolution. Uh, Sapphire or rather AMD claims this card is, well, optimized for 1080p gaming, which just means that you should be able to play everything at 1080p, which is true and which is even true with ray tracing on. So that's also a pretty good bonus. Uh, you don't really have to turn down the settings or turn off ray tracing in most games. Although when you go to 1440p, for example, uh, the story might kind of change. Starting with Forza Horizon 5, which runs pretty good on 1080p highest preset even with RTX on you get 60 plus FPS uh, with 1440p though we recommend switching on FSR because you are dropping down to about 40 FPS there going on to Hogwarts Legacy this is a very demanding RTX turned on although in 1080p in on max setting with RTX on you can't even reach a stable 30 fps so i would suggest either turning on fsr which does help but the problem is with hogwarts legacy is that um, rtx tends to create some issues in especially in um, pre-cutscenes where the fps drops to like three I would just on that game just turn off RTX completely. You will have double the performance as well when uh, not in cutscenes. So yeah, for Hogwarts Legacy, I would suggest just turning RTX off until the game gets patched. And these issues have been around since release. So I hope there will be some kind of patch in the future to remedy that. And obviously 1440p with RTX is also quite a big issue. In Cyberpunk, another, although relatively older title compared to the others, um, this is also a game that can be quite intensive, especially with RTX on. We tested here 1080p with Ultra RTX is uh, only netting us 30 FPS, so that is not really playable. Also, FSR is kind of buggy here. I did not get it to run correctly, so maybe your luck's better, but mine <laughs> definitely isn't. Without RTX, you can reach about 1440p and then you will be able to achieve 35 FPS or thereabouts. So even that might be a bit low, so you might have to turn down some settings or just go for no RTX, but at 1080p, so you will be able to get like 40, 50 FPS. Ratchet and Clank is another title that is kind of suboptimal. It has been ported from the PS5 to the PC, obviously, and it looks pretty good as well, but we have some issues with performance and we can't really activate RTX on our AMD card. If uh, you were able to turn it on, for example, on the AMD 7000 series cards, maybe it's just because I have a 6000 series, but even with the activator RTX on 1080p, we had massive performance issues, sometimes dropping below 30 FPS, and um, we had would have to turn down some settings or rather activate FSR to get that running smoothly because this game is pretty intensive and maybe that will be fixed in the future because it's just not optimized perfectly because of the porting. 
um, but I would say that you would have to turn down the settings from the maximum detail level down to about medium to high because otherwise the FPS are just too low in some scenarios especially when there's a big crowd around or when there are many particle effects um, present. Halo Infinite again without ray tracing but here we have a new title that also runs pretty good. So that is a good example of a game that looks pretty good and also runs pretty smoothly. On 1080p we achieve on max settings 60 plus FPS, so we don't have much issues there. Only when we turn it up to 1440p we drop down to like 45 when I would suggest turning down some settings because when the frame rate goes below 60 FPS in Halo, it kind of gets a bit, not choppy, but um, yeah, it's got, just for a shooter or a multiplayer game, I would not recommend it. Battlefield 2042 is somewhat of a difficult game to recommend playing with this card, or rather we have had some issues here as well. So uh, on 1080p, it runs pretty good, although we're not achieving 60 FPS, but rather, between 45 and 55 so i would recommend either turning off rtx which does increase performance somewhat or just in, uh, decreasing the settings from ultra to high um, which does help somewhat as well though we don't have fsr here we can only do or only set a dynamic resolution scaling this is not with ai resharpening or enhancing so that doesn't work as good um, you can achieve it on 1440p if you set it correctly 45 to 55 FPS on Ultra, but uh, I would rather suggest as well here to say if you're gonna play at 1440p to just uh, set the settings to medium or high so you achieve those 60 FPS even then, but with just a lower detail level. That's basically any of the games we wanted to show you because those are pretty much some problematic games and also games that are very very hard to run in some instances. We wanted to ask a question if you can run anything on this card which probably almost is possible. Obviously easier to run titles will be no problem for this card depending on the resolution of course 4k gaming might be kind of an issue but we'll look into that in the future. Um, on 1080p and 1440p we did not have any issues with 8GB of VRAM, although we did get close in some instances, but most of the time there were no issues with the VRAM or no limitations there because the GPU wasn't just not powerful enough to turn up the settings that much so that we had issues. Of course, if you spend like 300 bucks, the other alternative would be an RTX 3060 with 12 gigabytes, although that card is quite a bit slower, I think like 10% or something like that. Uh, and even that is a bit more expensive. The other alternative would be uh, getting an RTX 2080 Ti. And otherwise, yeah, maybe you let us know what you think of this card. I can say for 250 bucks, I think this is probably the best bang for your buck if you want to go for AMD or Nvidia. Um, obviously there's the alternative to go for the Intel A770 which would be the same price but um, does have some teething problems as far as drivers go. Anyway, I wish you a nice day and goodbye.